family. Appreciate that so very much. Grab your Bibles. We'll turn in a moment to a passage and uh, we get in this morning's message. Let me commend you, though, for your participation thus far in the music part of our worship service. Um, it's always uh, a thrill when you get involved, when you participate. And uh, you can participate two different ways. Number one, you can sing. That's important. And we encourage you to sing, participate. But I also think there's another level of participation, and that's you and I thinking about the words. Allowing our spirit to commune with the Holy Spirit and just to consider and dwell upon. And I think that certainly it's been uh, some great music this morning, but I also commend you for your participation in doing just that. I think that's crucial. And for you and I gather around God's word, we prepare our hearts and um, there's nothing like just dwelling upon the holiness of God than sitting at his feet and learning from a holy God as we gather around his word. So I trust we'll do that today. You remember the psalm that we were in at the end of last week? Don't worry, this isn't a part two or anything like that, okay? Uh, but you remember the psalm when we finished up in at the end of the last morning's message sermon? We were in Psalm chapter number 27. So would you turn there? Psalm chapter 27, we'll kind of use the last verse uh, of this passage as our springboard as we delve into this morning's message I trust will be an encouragement to you. Uh, as I read the word, as I study God's word, I like to ask the question, well, what does that mean? How do you do that? Why is that there? Many questions, as I trust many of you likewise do as we study God's word. It's great to ask those questions, but it's also better to find the answers, right? And so we come to verse number 14, if you will, Psalm chapter 27, and we read a, a reoccurrence of, in the statement or in the verse, of a statement in the verse. Notice what it says, verse number 14 uh, of Psalm 27. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Okay? So what we want to consider this morning is simply this, waiting on the Lord. What is it? What does it mean? What does it look like? How do I do it? On a daily basis and throughout the entirety of my life, how do I wait on the Lord? Now, what's interesting about this concept of waiting on the Lord, it has found some, um, the word wait, excuse me, is found some 24 times in the book of Psalms. Of those 24 times in the book of Psalms, the overwhelming majority, I'd say at least two-thirds, more likely three-quarters of the time that is found, it refers to a believer, one who trusts in God, one who looks to God as waiting on the Lord, waiting on the Lord. Now, when you and I think about waiting, what do we think of? Well, for me, immediately, one of the first things I go to is waiting at a railroad tracks in Lapeer. It just seems like I always hit that railroad track in Lapeer. One way or the other, I'm thankful for the, pad, the bypass on the backside of Lapeer to get around that. That's one thing that I think of. Another thing I think of is uh, waiting at a doctor's office. How many of you have visited a doctor's office uh, in the last month? Let's say the last month you visited that. That's many of us, right? Or a dentist or something else. I often think of waiting in the context of a doctor's office. For us here in Michigan, it may be waiting at a secretary of state, amen? And uh, waiting in line trying to get something with a license or a car registration, whatever the case may be. Or maybe it's a drive through It is the season of school. Maybe it's waiting in a dismissal line or a drop-off line for parents and things like that. Who knows? Whatever waiting might be for you. When I think of waiting at a doctor's office, and let's just give you some visual picture, amen? When I think of waiting at a doctor's office, you and I, maybe a dentist's office, whatever the case may be, you sign in, the receptionist says uh, something to the effect um, uh, of, <laughs> please have a seat to wait. Uh, and we will bring you back shortly. And you and I laugh when they say we'll bring you back shortly, amen? And uh, sometimes that happens. Most often it does not, right? And uh, so you and I will sit down, we'll begin to wait, and we think of this as what? Sitting and waiting, sitting and waiting. We're confined to that room. Maybe we only have a magazine to read, or uh, maybe we have our phone to do something on while we wait. Finally, the inner door of the inner sanctum opens up. Nurse sticks their head out and they call your name and you're excited. It's like you won the lottery, though we don't play that. Um, okay, it's like you, uh, you won the greatest thing, right? And they call you back into that thing. And what happens? This is the part I love. They take you to, from, to a much smaller room in which there's less to occupy your time as you wait again. Isn't that fun? And uh, they take you back there. Maybe the nurse gets your vitals or whatever the case may be. She looks at you and says, hey, just sit down and wait. The doctor will be with you shortly. And again, we laugh because that hardly ever happens, it seems, right? 
and we seem to be running behind, whatever the case may be. And so, um, nonetheless, uh, we're sitting there, we're waiting. The doctor finally comes in, and after waiting confined to that room, he shows up. He spends some time diagnosing our ailments or sicknesses, and maybe something, he says something to this effect. Wait here, and the nurse, nurse will bring back your paperwork or your prescriptions, whatever the case may be, and you'll be good to go. And sometimes we have to wait for that paperwork to come back or whatever the case may be before we leave. Sometimes then we go to the pharmacy. We wait in line at the pharmacy to get the medicine that we need, right? And so as we think of waiting in terms of this physical waiting that we all experience in life, we would have to describe it as such. It's often being restricted or confined in our movements and our actions. Simply biding our time until the wait is over and we can move on. How many times it's been exciting to finally get out of the doctor's office? You spent a couple hours there and you're finally free. We think of waiting that way, out of the Secretary of State, uh, whatever the case may be, whatever the, uh, the context is, we're, we're glad to be done with that waiting. Now, here's a huge difference. There's a big difference between what I might term physical waiting and what we might describe here in verse 14 as biblical or spiritual waiting, waiting on the Lord as it's described here. You see, when you and I are waiting on the Lord in any given circumstances, and if we just simply bide our time as we would do physically, if, if we just feel confined and restricted in our movements, then we will miss all that God wants this waiting time to do for us and in us. God always has a purpose in all he does. Therefore, there is a purpose to you and I waiting on the Lord. Wait, I say, wait on the Lord. That little four-letter word, wait, it's repeated twice in the, the verse here, and as I said, 20, some 24 times in the book of Psalms. The Hebrew word translated as this English word uh, has a little bit more uh, definition than the common usage of the, uh, the English word that we use in the wait. The times of the translators of our Bible, the English word wait, had as one of its prominent definitions the statement, to stay or rest in expectation. To stay or rest in expectation. To rest in expectation and patience. It broadens it quite a bit. It elaborates. In fact, I put it this way. It's that sense of expectation that has as its root something inherent to biblically, spiritually waiting. Okay, so uh, let's move beyond physical waiting. Let's understand, all right, inherent to what he writes in verse 14 and other places in the Scripture, this idea of waiting in the Lord has inherent to it the aspect of trust in the Lord. In fact, that was kind of the theme of uh, many of the songs today, or at least alluded to in those songs, right? Trusting in God, the verse we read right before the, the choir special. Trust in Jehovah. That is inherent to this uh, biblical waiting on the Lord. I would call it this. It is a trusting expectation. By the very definition of the word wait, it is a trusting expectation. As you wait in that outer waiting room of the doctor's office, you experience some trust that eventually the door will open, that you will be called back, and you expect, you trust, you will see the doctor. Now, can I tell you, I've sat in a doctor's office before, and I've waited with other people. And there's, been, there's happened before where a nurse either comes out or the receptionist calls somebody name, somebody's name, and they, they come up to the reception window or the desk, and they tell them, or the person comes out to them to talk, and they say, listen, hey, uh, I know you're here to see Dr. So-and-so, but he's had an emergency, and he had to leave, so you won't be able to see him today. Now, that would be pretty disappointing, wouldn't it, after waiting in a doctor's office and getting that news and so forth? Likely you are very understanding. Uh, he had to run off to an emergency and take care of it. Here's reality, though. When we think of waiting, and, and reality is, have you, have you ever waited in line and you got to something and, and they didn't have anything left or they closed right as you were in line and so forth? That's happened many times to many different people. Well, biblical waiting uh, has something to it much better, and that's this. We can trust in the Lord without fear of being let down. Or our trust going unfulfilled. Our <laughs> expectation is secure in the faithfulness of God. The verse earlier said, his strength is everlasting. 
Literally, the reality is this. My expectation in waiting on the Lord is not grounded in any of my attributes, anything that I have. It is grounded and secure in God's faithfulness. May I ask a rhetorical question this morning? How faithful is your God? How faithful is your God? If our biblical waiting on the Lord, if our uh, trusting expectation is rooted on the faithfulness of God, how faithful is your God? Well, I don't know about you, but I sure have found God to be faithful. I found Him to be faithful. As those verses said earlier, forever, forever. Hence, that means that you and I in turn can wait on the Lord how? Well, verse 13 or 14 says it. Number one, wait courageously. Wait courageously. Did you catch it at verse number 14? We read it uh, here in Psalm 27. We wait on the Lord, be of good courage. One of the songs we heard earlier spoke to this truth too. And one has stated, what does it mean to be of good courage? Well, one has defined it as such or stated it. To be of good courage is to possess the inner quality that enables a person to confront danger and difficulty without fear and with calmness, boldness, confidence, strength, and trust instead. I would say this, he describes an inner quality here. That is that, uh, um, uh, the trusting expectation that you and I as believers can have. See, for the believer, it is resting in the strength of the object of our trust, the faithfulness of the object of our trust. That's the Lord. So you and I are challenged today, be courageous in our waiting on the Lord. What are you waiting on the Lord for today? What, what, are you, what is it in your life that you're waiting on the Lord for? Maybe it's just uh, a provision for today. Maybe it's direction for tomorrow. Whatever the case may be, maybe it's just simply, you know what, I can't wait. I'm looking forward to the day that Christ takes me home. So I'm waiting on the Lord. So in waiting on the Lord, you and I can be courageous. Be of good courage. So wait courageously. The courage comes from the assurance that we have that our trust in the Lord is not misplaced. As we de detailed a moment ago, that word wait speaks of expecting. So you and I can expect to receive from the Lord, and that expectation will surely be met. So you and I are to allow the Holy Spirit to work in us. As he does so, we let that trusting expectation produce courage in your heart. How do you face tomorrow? Well, I hope you face it tomorrow because you have a trusting expectation in a faithful God. He won't let you down. He's a faithful God, so you can courageously face tomorrow. You can courageously face anything that you have coming up in your life because you're just simply waiting on the Lord. It's a courage so I'd ask you today, number one, do you trust your God? Do you trust in Him? Can you say this morning that you found Him faithful? And if these things are true, then be courageous in your waiting on Him in any and every circumstance. I'll wait on the Lord. Wait, I say, wait on the Lord. There's another passage that we see that describes it. Will you just look over two chapters previous? The psalmist says it here in Psalm 25, verse 5. Read the verse with me as I read it out loud. It says this, Psalm 25, verse 5. Lead me in thy truth. Teach me. For thou art the God of my salvation, and on thee do I wait all the day. Another aspect of this waiting on God, it's not just sitting and waiting. The reality is, number one, I ought to wait courageously. I ought to be of good courage as I face everything in the next day that God has for it. Number two, we ought to wait continually. I like his description, all the day I wait on the Lord. Continually, it's a constant thing. We noted earlier that the, that, uh, the terminology of the word wait literally means to rest in patience. Patience. I don't know about you, but I struggle at times in patience, maybe in my car or somewhere else. Struggle with patience. You and I are called to rest in patience. Here, the psalmist is speaking of something that his trusting expectation in him has produced. Okay, So he has a trusting expectation. His faithfulness and trust in God has produced courage to face tomorrow, but also has produced something else. It has produced in him a continual patient dependence and reliance upon God. 
That every day that I can look to God and, and wait on Him today to, to do what I've asked Him to do, to do what He's promised to do. I can wait on the Lord in His reliance and dependence upon a God who's faithful. In fact, I would dare say that the psalmist expresses a dependence upon God for everything. Everything. How often it is easy for you and I to go throughout our days on a daily basis and we do not rely on the strength of God. We do not rely on the grace of God. We do not rely on the encouragement of God. And we look to other things for it. And how disappointed we are at the end of the day when you and I could rather instead look to God. His statement here in this verse is quite powerful. On thee do I wait all the day. I would ask you this morning, are you waiting on the Lord all the day? Is your expectation and trust in Him continually for all things? We are promised that such patience will surely be rewarded. Therefore, we're encouraged to wait patiently. I like how one author described it, patience. He said this, <coughs> excuse me, patience is the fair handmaid and daughter of faith, trust. We cheerfully wait when we are certain that we shall not wait in vain. It is our duty and our privilege to wait upon the Lord in service and in worship, in expectancy, in trust, all the days of our life. I like how he terms it. It is our duty and our privilege. We wait cheerfully. We wait patiently. Why? Because we know we will not be left, or that hope, we will not be left unfulfilled. That hope is not in vain. That trust in him is not in vain. It's a patient dependence and reliance upon God. Can I ask you this morning, are you patiently, continually relying and depending upon your God today? Do you express to God your dependence upon him? Father, I'm looking to you today. I'm trusting you today. I'm relying on you today. I, boy, I sure do need your help. I won't be able to face today without you. God, I need you to walk with me. I need you to be with me every single step of today. Do you really wait on the day of all the day on the God of your salvation. I like how the psalmist said that. Listen, I've trusted you for salvation. I can trust you for today. I'll wait on you all the day. Or instead, does your, does your patience with God often grow thin? What he's doing and what he doesn't do, his, his lack of answer to prayer in the way that you would want, it doesn't come out the way that you would desire. Does your patience fade? Does your patience with God wax thin? God, I, and we then in turn stop relying and depending upon him. I would exhort each one of us today to simply do what the psalmist has encouraged us. When you wait on the Lord, wait continually, patiently. Exhibit a patient dependence and reliance upon your God in all things that springs from that trusting expectation. Wait courageously. Wait continually. Number three, turn with me if you will. We'll keep in Psalms, obviously. Psalm chapter 52. Psalm chapter 52. We find another description of this waiting on the Lord and what it means to wait on the Lord in all things. In this life and certain circumstances, situations, whatever the case may be. Maybe there's a, a prayer request that you've brought multiple times before the Lord and now you're just waiting on Him. How we ought to do that. Wait courageously, wait continually. And we come to Psalm 52, verse 9, and we see another description. It says this, I will praise thee forever because thou hast done it. And I will wait on thy name, for it is good before thy saints. This kind of flows with the idea of God's faithfulness a moment ago. But we'd say this, wait courageously, wait continually. And waiting on the Lord also involves waiting confidently. Confidently. Thou hast done it, and I will wait on thy name. Trust today, and God today has been vindicated by his past actions. We could say his past faithfulness. Let me put it another way, and this is a, a good way to write it. Past blessings create present confidences. Have you been blessed of the Lord? Has the Lord answered prayers in your past? Has, has God shown himself strong on your behalf? Are there times that you can think of that you can praise God for how he has worked and what he has done in your life? Past blessings create present confidences. 
I can trust him. I can have confidence in him today. So I can wait on him forever because I am confident that my God will do what he says he's done, he will do. Because I've seen it. He, he's, the blessings have flowed from his hands before. He always comes through. Hudson Taylor, he was the, the founder of the China Inland Mission, himself a great missionary in different ways. In his home, he had a plaque that hung there for many, many years. On the plaque, he had recorded on there two Hebrew words, one a name. It was this. The first was Ebenezer, and the second was Jehovah Jireh. You know those two words. You know the first, Ebenezer. It simply means hitherto hath the Lord helped us. To this point, we have found God faithful. We have seen in the past that he's done great things. He has, he has been there, our help. And then Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will see to it or the Lord will provide. The Lord provides. And I love how he has that because you see that in that one plaque, these two statements, these two words. One looked back while the other looked forward. In essence, one reminded him of God's faithfulness. The other of God's assurances. The faithfulness in the past. I found God to be true. I have found God to always be there. So today I can wait on the Lord. I can be courageous. I can continually wait on him. And I can be confident because of his assurances for the future. Because these things are true, we wait confidently on God. Can I ask you this simple question this morning today? Is God your only hope? For tomorrow to go well, do you hope in yourself or do you hope in God? For things to work as you would have them to, do you hope in the way your ability to work things out and to orchestrate, administrate things? Or you, Lord, my hope is in you alone. I look to you waiting confidently as the hymnist might describe he is the anchor of my soul the anchor of my soul i have confidence in him may i ask you this morning is that how you are waiting on the lord today in your situation your circumstances do you have a hopeful confidence that trust in him in all things this is the biblical waiting you and I are called to display, to possess. It is a courageous, it is continual, it is confident. But the psalmist would also have us to understand something else about this waiting on the Lord. Look with me, if you will, to Psalm 37. We go back a few chapters, Psalm 37. Notice the description given to us in Psalm 37, verse number 34. Psalm 37, verse number 34. Starts out with our phrase, simply this, wait on the Lord and keep his way. And he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. Okay? What we see here, number four, is this, wait consistently. So wait courageously, wait continually, wait confidently, wait consistently. Here's the one big way that biblical waiting is so different than what we think of physical waiting and so forth. What is God saying? Don't miss it. He's saying this. Don't just sit there and wait, but rather, rather wait and do. Rather wait and do. Wait on the Lord and keep his way. We cannot expect to receive from the Lord unless we ensure that we are walking in his ways. Stay the course. Walk the narrow way. In fact, let's put it this way. Walk in the ways of the Lord as you wait on the Lord. To walk in the ways of the Lord as you wait on the Lord. Make sure that we're not just sitting in a chair like in a doctor's office. All right, Lord, what are you going to do? And do absolutely nothing. Have no focus about following him, keeping his way, as he would say in the passage here. So it would beg the question of you and I this morning as God's children. When God could speak from heaven and give us a report, would he say that's true of us today? If God could talk to you and he gives you a little report on how you're doing when he say that you are consistently keeping his way. Or, or has that kind of gone by the wayside? Has that failed because you've been waiting on him for this thing? You, 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 you've kind of been so focused on this and in waiting on him, you, you've kind of let things slide, the keeping of his way. See, such consistency in our walk is the action of waiting on the Lord. It is, call, is what we are called to do as we wait on the Lord. Have you ever been sitting in a doctor's office and, and uh, the receptionist says, okay, while you're waiting, and they hand you a clipboard, they say, hey, I'd like you to fill out these forms. 
We need your insurance updated. We need this information, uh, uh, past surgeries, you name it. Would you just fill out this form as you sit and wait for the doctor and you sit down? My friend, that is very similar to what God is saying. And God is saying this, please keep my way and obey my words as you wait on me. Keep in the way. Don't forsake it. So waiting on the Lord does not mean you and I just don't focus on anything. It doesn't mean that we, we give up doing anything. No, it's quite the opposite. God says, when you wait on me, keep my way. Do my ways. Obey my word. Fulfill the things that I have commanded to thee. Ensure that you are consistently doing such today. Purpose in your heart this morning to display a courageous, a continual, a confident, a consistent waiting on the Lord in your life. Turn with me, another one, look at Psalm chapter 59, if you will. Psalm, Psalm chapter 59. Psalm chapter 59, we look at verse number 9. I like this one. I think it speaks to where you and I often find ourselves in waiting on the Lord. We can grow anxious. We can grow worrisome. We, we can get worked up, if we might describe it such spiritually. Psalm chapter 59, verse 9, describes it as such. Notice this, because of his strength... Will I wait upon thee? For God is my defense. Okay? Number five, wait calmly. Wait calmly. When we wait on the Lord, we're called to wait calmly. Now, there's an interesting statement in this verse. Look at it again. It says, because his strength. Well, the his here is not referring to God. It's not saying because of God's strength, I will wait on the Lord. That's not what it's saying. If you look in the prior passage or verses, you'll see that it's referring to the heathen or our enemies. Because of the enemies that we face, because of the, the strength of the heathen, that then moves me to trust in God and find out that my God is a great defense. Could we put it this way? Our enemy is strong. Our troubles are many. Our difficulties plenteous. Our sorrows multiplied. But we have a refuge to whom we can run. So wait on the Lord. And wait calmly. No matter what's happening, no matter what's going on in your life, no matter the difficulties, the troubles, the sorrows we have faced, we have a defense, we have a refuge to whom we can run. One has rightly said it is a wise thing to find in the greatness of our difficulties a reason for casting ourselves upon the Lord. You say, Pastor Henry, boy, you don't know how many burdens I've come in here today with. You don't, you don't know what I have to face this week. You don't know what I faced past this past week. It has just been overwhelming. Can I tell you, that is, a, that is good news. You say, what in the world? Why is that good news? Because that is a great time to go find that God is faithful, that God is good. And it is a good time to be reminded, I need to cast everything on him, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Giving it to it all. Just, and when you and I find the defense that is God, when we find the refuge that our God can be, the anchor of our soul, we find peace. See, when we cast our cares upon him with our trusting expectation, there is our trusting expectation. We're waiting. Wait on the Lord. Trusting expectation. He's going to take care of it. So nothing disturbs me. Nothing disturbs me. God protects us by his presence. And as the Bible says, it produces a peace in the greatest of storms. In fact, a peace that passes what? All understanding. As we often sit in a doctor's waiting room, we're waiting for the doctor. And maybe on certain occasions, you're waiting for a test result. Ever been there? What's the x-ray going to show? What's the scan going to show? What's the blood test going to show? And boy, as we sit there and, and we're waiting for a phone call and, and it just seems to never come. And boy, we can become anxious. We can worry. We can get worked up over those things, the news the doctor will share. But can I tell you this morning, if you're waiting on the Lord, you say, Pastor Henry, there's this thing that I've been praying about in my life for a long time and I'm just waiting on the Lord. Can I tell you, even as you wait on the Lord, it's nothing like waiting in a doctor's office. You and I can be at perfect peace. We can be calm. Why? Because we have a trusting expectation in a faithful God, a good God. So you and I, we can wait calmly on God to do what God does. We can have a calmness and a peace that is foreign to every person who does not know Christ because God is not their refuge. 
For us, He's our defense, He's our hope, He's our peace. May I ask you this morning, are you waiting calmly? Something you're waiting on the Lord for? Are you waiting calmly? It'd be very easy to read the news headlines and see all that's going on around us. And can I tell you, we could get anxious and we could be worried over this place that we live in. It can be very disheartening. It can be very sorrowful to see what's happening in America, what's happening in this world. And you and I are just simply waiting on the Lord to take us home. But my friend, because we've read the last chapter, we know how good and great our God is, how faithful our God is. You and I, as we bide our time here on earth, you know what we can do? We can wait calmly. We don't have to get worked up over all the bad news. We don't have to get all anxious and worrisome over all the bad things that are happening in this world. My friend, the day is coming when Jesus Christ is going to take us home. And it's coming. We can be confident. We can wait calmly, waiting on the Lord. So the, the psalmist speaks of here, you and I have every reason to do so. Why? Because God is truly our refuge. We have one final description of how you and I ought to wait. We ought to wait courageously, continually, confidently, consistently, calmly. And then would you turn with me to Psalm 123, verse number 2, be our last passage we look at, our last description, uh, definition of what it means to wait on the Lord. Psalm 123, if you will, look with me and we'll... We just read verse number two. It is a quite descriptive verse. I love this verse. It is historically applicable. It is, it is historically descriptive, if you think of it that way. Look at Psalm 123 and verse number two. Behold, as the eyes of servants look up to the hand of their masters, and as the eyes of a maiden unto the hand of her mistress, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God. Until that he have mercy upon us. Okay, number six. What does it mean to wait on the Lord? It means this. It means to wait concentratingly. To wait concentratingly. Okay, what do we mean by that? Well, first of all, admittedly, that's not a real word. Okay, and uh, so the people who say words are such, they say that's not a word. I don't really care what they think at this moment. Okay, I borrowed it from somebody else, and so if they can use it, I can use it too. So wait concentratingly, all right? What do we mean by that? Well, we're talking about the idea of waiting on God, necessitating giving our focused attention to God. So as I wait on him, my attention is given to him. I, I, I am, he has my full and undivided attention. I'm, I'm focusing on him. Now, the example biblically is quite unique. It's, as I said, historical uh, in its um, context. Okay? It's of a master or a mistress of a great house. Servants are at their beckoning call. The, these servants stand around the room and maybe around the table, and they're, 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 they're ready and, uh, to, to do whatever the master wills. They are literally standing there, and they're watching their lord or their lady very carefully. They're very attentive to what their lord and lady is doing. In fact, not just what they're doing, but to any of their slightest movements. In times of old, and I think of maybe England and places like that where they had a king and a queen and lords and ladies, at times when the servants were there, and even sometimes slaves in context, when they were there, they'd watch and they, they'd just look at the, the, the master, the lord, the lady, the queen, the king, and, and they would shun using words, they'd just give a little movement of the hand. That's literally what the verse expresses here. The mistress just kind of moves her hand like this, and immediately they're watching. Maybe it's a nod of the head or something like that, a little flick of the head, whatever the case may be. And that servant is so intently watching, concentrating just on their master. In fact, there's a French historian. His name was Claude Savary. I'm sure I'm, I, I am savaging the last name, but his name is Claude Savary. He lived, uh, he lived in the 1700s. He visited um, Egypt, and he gave an account in some letters that he wrote back to England. And this is what he said. Here's what he described happening in the great houses of Egypt. He said this, The slaves stand with their hands laid crosswise over their breasts, silent at the end of the hall. Their eyes are directed to the master, and they are attentive to the slightest indication of his will. They are fixated, as you saw this part that I skipped just a moment ago. Their eyes are literally fixated upon their master. They don't want to miss a sign. They don't want to miss an indicator. They don't want to fail to obey it. This is exactly what the Bible speaks of as the one who waits on the Lord. 
If you and I are waiting in the Lord, it isn't just like, okay, yeah, we lost uh, sight of everything. Maybe you're in a doctor's office, you're reading a magazine, you're on your phone, you've kind of lost uh, focus or attention, you're not concentrating on what's happening there or, or whatever. And, and have you ever seen somebody come out and they call a name? Uh, Mr., um, Mr. Edwards, is there a Mr. Edwards here? And you know, everybody looks around except for like one or two people to read their magazine. You ever had the nurse say it two or three times and finally get somebody goes, oh, and they jump up and it's them. He's Mr. Edwards. Do you realize that's the exact opposite of what the, the psalmist is saying here? When I wait on the Lord, and I am fixated upon my, my, my master. My gaze, I'm concentrating completely on him. Literally, the one who claims to be waiting on the Lord will endeavor to know the mind of the Lord in order to do the will of the Lord. We imagine in times, gone, uh, uh, times past in history, the servant was just standing there and his eyes were fixated upon his master. The least little nod, the least little wink, the least little nudge, whatever, hand movement, as the verse might describe of a mistress. He is ready to go to work. He is ready to obey. He is ready to heed the command. Literally, for you and I, what does that mean? When we wait on the Lord for something, we give ourselves to God and His Word, and we yield to the indwelling Spirit. We give them our full attention in this life so that you and I are ready for any command the Lord would give us as we wait on the Lord. Oh, it's not sitting and waiting and doing nothing. No, it is sitting and our eyes fully fixed upon our God. Famed British preacher and theologian of the early 1900s, G. Campbell Morgan, he described it this way, and I like what he says it is not. He says, waiting on God is not laziness. It is not going to sleep. Waiting for God is not the abandonment of effort. Waiting for God means first, activity under command. Second, readiness for any new command that may come. Third, the ability to do nothing until the command is given. I love the last little statement. We're fixating or we're focusing on the readiness for any new command. When you and I wait on the Lord, we ought not to grow lethargic. We ought not to grow passive. We ought not to get our gaze off of God. We ought to continually say, what does the master want me to do? What would he have me to do as I wait on my Lord? The last statement, I like it. He says, the ability to do nothing until the command is given. That sounds counter to what we just talked about until you realize his statement is this. I will do nothing in my own strength. The servant standing there in the hall says, doesn't decide, well, you know what, I'm thirsty. I'm going to go drink out of that pitcher. Takes the pitcher off his master's table. He doesn't do that. He doesn't do any effort or do anything of his own volition. He only does what his master commands. The delights of his master. And so my friend, you and I are called when we wait upon the Lord to do such. That is why this, this laser-like focus of one who waits on the Lord. Psalm 65, 5 puts it this way. My soul, wait thou only upon God. For my expectation is from him. Trusting expectation. In this passage, Psalm 123, you see what verse 1 says? Look at it, verse 1, Psalm 123, it says this, Unto thee lift, up, uh, lift I up mine eyes. I lift up mine eyes. Unto thee. I, I, it's the only place that I'm looking as I wait on you to fixate our gaze upon him. Be always ready to do his will. As you and I consider all these biblical descriptions of waiting on the Lord, we see how very different spiritual waiting is from physical waiting. So as we think about waiting on the Lord, and I don't know in context for you today what all that you're waiting on the Lord, at the very least, we're waiting on Him for eternity, for heaven, for salvation to be full and complete. But I don't know in your life right now what you're waiting on Him for, but could I ask you this? Is it a courageous waiting? Is it a continual waiting? Is it a confident waiting? Is it a consistent waiting? Is it a calm waiting? And is it a concentrating waiting? I believe the Holy Spirit would have you and I now, in these next few moments, and what we might call this invitation, to evaluate our own waiting on God to ensure that it meets the description here above. 
This invitation, as we step into it in a moment, as the piano begins to play, it is a time of reflection. It is also a time of introspection. And it is a great time for you and I to ask God, Father, I'm waiting on you here in this way, in this area, in this situation. Help me to do it as you would have me to do it. Father, help all these descriptions to be a part of my life. And if not, would you give me the grace and the strength to make sure that they are? Father, we thank you for your word. I'm grateful.